Okay, good evening and welcome to the Pittsburgh Central School District Board of Education meeting via, via Zoom. If we could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First person coming into the meeting is Ben Peterson. Okay, first off, we'd like to just offer a moment of silence for the lives lost in this pandemic and for those families impacted by COVID-19 within our own community. Thank you. Okay, Matt, do we have people in public comment? Uh, ben is in the, in the room and he is connected to audio right now. Okay, if I could just lay some ground rules since this is um, kind of a new format for all of us. And if you have not followed our board meetings to date, we have one public comment session and it is at the beginning of our meeting this evening. And anyone who is joining us in the public waiting room, we just ask that you state your name and address. Um, and if you could limit your comments to three minutes, we're gonna offer you a three minute maximum. Okay. I have Ben Petrison. Ben? Ben? Yes. Hi, Ben. Hello. Do you have a question? Um, yeah, so um, I'm wondering if, if you guys know the, the plan for, um, for the fall. For the plan for? Uh, the fall. Sure. So, so I would um, address that, Ben, by saying that um, every Wednesday, uh, this, all the county superintendents and I meet with Dr. Mendoza, um, and all of our conversations for the last two weeks, um, and will continue through Wednesday, will be what we need to do uh, to reopen in the fall. Uh, today, the, the governor um, announced um, a staging of things opening in our county. And uh, so our hope is, um, and our belief is that if things go as planned, uh, then we will all be in school in the fall. Um, so what the governor said today is that he, he's kind of shifted the control from the state to the region. Um, and he approved our region's reopening plan in four phases. And schools are in phase four. So as we continue to conference with Dr. Mendoza, all of our meetings are really about um, what we need to do to keep the doors open for our students and staff in September. And so that is, that's what we're planning for. Um, in, in the same vein, um, know that there are so many unanswered and evolving scenarios and changes that happen. Um, we believe we're going to be open in September. We're planning to be open in September. Um, we hope that we're open in September, um, but we're also planning um, on a plan B in the event that doesn't happen. So we're going to start seeing things opening uh, this week. Um, the Monroe County Health Department will be monitoring um, everything from new cases to hospitalizations to deaths. Um, and as long as we're on the right trajectory or trajectory, um, I don't see um, us not going to phase two and then phase three and then phase four. So um, <laughs> I wish I could give you a better answer, um, but my conversations right now seem very positive that we will be opening in September. Okay. Ben, can I just ask for your address, please? Uh, yes, um, 85 North Wilmarth Road. Thank you so much. Hey, Ben, thanks for coming on tonight. Yeah. 
Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Anyone else, Matt? Yep, we have another one. This is uh, Dylan. I'm going to let them in now. Okay. Hi, Dylan. Welcome. If you could just state your address, please. And Dylan is currently connecting the audio right now. Okay. Minute. Hi, Dylan. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Dylan. If you could just state your full name and address for us, please. Dylan Boothby. And then 159 Rossler Road. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and do you have a comment or question tonight? I do not, no. Okay. There's a separate link, Dylan. There are two links on our website. You can either join um, for our public comment session, which is what you're in right now. Okay. And then, and there's, then there's a separate link to join the meeting to watch. Okay. I'm gonna hey, join the one to watch then. D Dylan, before you leave. Yes. Uh, this is um, Superintendent Puro. Mm -hmm. Just know I always click the wrong link too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I will do the other one one second. We're all guilty. We're all guilty. <laughs> okay, thanks, one second. Thanks for joining us, Dylan. No problem. Hey, Matt. Yeah. Matt, Matt. Yes. So, so we have to get Ben off the screen, too. Okay. Thank you. And we have one person left, and this is uh, Robin Scott. Okay. And... Are you there, Robin? Yes. Hi, Robin. Welcome. Thank you. How are you, Amy? Did you have something you'd like to share with the public or to the board? Oh. Yes, I'm running for school board this year, Pittsburgh School Board, and I would appreciate your support. Okay, thank you. Hey, Robin. Yes. Can you also just give your um, address? My address is 18 Bay Colony Drive, Pittsburgh, New York. Thank you. Division. Thank you. Robin, I don't know if you saw the second link on the homepage for viewing and watching the meeting. No, I didn't. Okay, there are two links. The one that you're on right now is for public comment session. Oh, okay. So Thank if you can log out of this link and then log so. back into the other link, that would be great. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Amy, at this time, the meeting room, the the waiting room is empty. Okay. And let's move along. May I have an approval of the agenda, please? Renee and Kim? Any edits, comments? Nope. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, it's time for the 2020-2021 proposed budget presentation and adoption. I think we're beginning with Mike. Thank you, Amy. So I want to just give a, an overview, a, a quick overview of our, our current environment that we're in. Um, it, it's posed quite a bit of unprecedented challenges as we put together our budget. And I would note that it's very easy to get lost in these challenges and lose sight of the foundational requirements and premise of developing, presenting, and adopting a New York State school budget. Um, there are many unknowns still to this date from the governor's office that we're going to need to, um, or will eventually um, have clarity to. At this point though, should we be screen sharing, Matt? Um, you're on mute. Uh, you, I've got Darren's presentation. Is that what you want? Yeah. All right, Darren's gonna, Darren's gonna present that. 
Okay, Darren, you're on mute too, so you can unmute and then if you can screen share. You might have to make him a co-host. Right. Are you saying that you're able to share, Darren? Hang on. Beautiful. Okay. How's that? Yep. So we can go to the next slide. And so tonight we're going to work through the first level of challenge, which is protecting as much of the usual as we absorb the intricacies of today's changed environment. This proposed budget will allow us to preserve and to protect program for our students for the following year, a year probably more than ever where they need as much support as possible. Tonight's presentation will largely follow the normal budget adoption presentation and process. Tonight's purpose of our um, adoption is not changed. Next. So the purpose of this evening is to present the superintendent's recommended 2021 budget to the Board of Education to consider adopting as their budget to then be presented to the voters. Tonight there will be official Board of Education action required. Um, you will be voting on the approval and adopting the total spending plan any additional propositions. And within that is the approval of the New York State Tax Property um, Report Card. So it feels like forever ago um, that we started this process. Uh, we started this in winter and around January. Um, actually this year, I believe we started in December, uh, working on our guidelines, thinking about what our budget uh, should encumber and encompass uh, for the following school year. And I would say that uh, never has it been more important than now to have a student-based budget, um, which means it's a budget that's based on our students, um, which is why we're in this business. And some of the things that I would just highlight that I feel are more relevant now than ever, as we talk about re-entry re -entry into school, uh, next year, I think about how important um, social emotional learning supports are going to be, mental health supports, uh, inclusive practices. Uh, and then I think we quickly forget um, how important, um, as we've been gone for a while, a, a safe school environment and safe facilities are. Um, we have a lot of work to do as we reenter, um, creating a safe, uh, inclusive, um, environment with lots of supports for students um, that otherwise um, we wouldn't have needed as much of. Uh, next, Darren. Interestingly, we've always held um, very close to our hearts uh, the concept of high quality professional learning. Uh, we've always believed that professional learning um, is foundational uh, to um, having the people in front of our students um, being as well equipped and as um, um, knowledgeable uh, around best practices. And next year is, is no different um, other than uh, some of our professional development as we look forward will probably look like um, learning different platforms. Um, being able to reduce the platforms uh, where we teach remote learning. Not because I think we're gonna go back to remote learning, um, but to prepare for um, any type of emergency where we might need to close. Um, I think it's irresponsible not to do that. So taking in a lot of feedback from our community and our, and our um, parents at home uh, and even our students and our staff, uh, we have multiple platforms um, for engaging students and what we'd like to do uh, for ease of use 
uh, and for organization, um, for families, uh, is to have our staff uh, be well equipped in one or two platforms instead of the magnitude that we have now. Um, also thinking about the professional development we might have to, to learn in the worst case scenario around formative assessments and assessments and, and other online things. Um, I think about the uh, vehicle that we have internally called New York Learns where we can house our best practices that are shared across uh, the district by grade level, by department. Um, so honing in on those essential learning skills and, and, and how to deliver them uh, in the most engaging way possible. So again, I think that the, the, while these were, were developed in uh, December, um, they've never rung more true than, they, than, than now, um, especially thinking about coming off the heels of this pandemic. Uh, we also need to be sensitive uh, to limited uh, community resources and balancing that with the investment in education and seeking new revenue. Uh, this, is, this is parallel to, to this area, but um, our Pittsburgh Education Foundation has really um, become more robust because of our community um, supporting in more than $55,000 worth of, of gift cards to meet some families' most basic needs, which are groceries and putting food on the table. We will continue to look uh, at partnerships um, for um, advancement and funds uh, to offset the cost of different programs. Um, Darren, you wanna go next, please? Uh, fiscal stability now and into the future through, through different vehicles. Um, one that you'll hear soon is that because we've had financially prudent and sustainable reserve accounts um, and, and probably been the most fiscally healthy um, than we've been um, in a very, very long time, uh, we are able to, to use um, and protect our community's investment um, and our students through the use of reserves. Uh, so what you'll see tonight is that we're gonna propose uh, for the board to adopt a budget that's within our tax cap. Um, and at the same time, um, at this point, um, not have to dig deep into uh, cuts, um, especially at a time when um, we are reintroducing our students and staff to school. Um, we will be looking at the use of reserves uh, to offset cuts uh, from the uh, New York State budget. And then lastly, and obviously, we always have to meet legal mandates and contractual obligations, uh, which needs to be part of our guidelines. So tonight, as far as an agenda is concerned, um, you'll see a summary uh, of the detailed programs and services budget binder, a summary of revenue sources and the enacted New York State budget. You'll review the proposed 2021 budget following the program and services format, addressing highlights and unique nuances and implications of the pandemic and New York State budget deficit on all of us. Um, I would just ask that you look below um, at our equation, which simply states that the superintendent's proposed budget equals our 1920 approved budget plus the 2021 net cost of programs minus the net of New York State enacted budget and governor reductions in federal CARES aid. Uh, so a much different equation this year um, as we look at uh, negative line items as far as state aid and support from New York State to this point. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Darren. Um, and before I do, I, I will share that um, the business office has, has been nonstop on our budget. Um, it's been evolving. Uh, information has been evolving. Uh, forecasting has been evolving. Um, and there's probably never been more variables in a budget than I can remember in my time as this year. So I want to thank Darren and um, Leanne and others in the, the business department for all their work to date. And so with that, Darren, if you could take us through the appropriations. Sure. So this presentation is gonna follow the budget binder. Um, it's electronically in the board section of the website. 
If any of you want it hard copy, let me know or send me an email and we will get that to you as soon as possible. Um, but this uh, summary is the appropriation side of the budget and it follows the actual tabs. So we have the schools, uh, the small font adds up to the bigger font at the top there. Um, and then the various other main areas and the budget is a little over a $3.6 million increase, uh, which is 2.66%, a little over $140 million up from 137 or so um, from the current year. Moving in, drilling down to look a little deeper uh, at the schools, if you will, um, every school has certain sections of their budget, which is in that bottom chart. Uh, we call them functions. So the school administration, school support, et cetera. The reason we do the chart in this manner is so that you can see the data in different ways. So if you ever question, for example, how much do we spend for co-curricular and athletics because it's spread out through all the buildings, you can look here and see that it's uh, proposed to be $2.4 million for next year. So looking at the elementary schools, and you can see the same function areas right going across there. Um, a lot of um, investment, if you will, in social, social uh, emotional learning and behavioral supports. Uh, special education is an area that can fluctuate from year to year as it moves throughout the budget. This can be for a bubble of students, their special needs, or some special programs that they need. Sometimes it can be just because of changes that BOCES or, or the center that they go to if they're not in district um, and how they provide their services. Basically all sections of the budget um, do have some retirement attrition savings that has been factored in. Moving on to the middle school, um, speaking of that retirement attrition, you see that in the school support, it's a negative number. Um, in the pupil services area, that has to do with some of the behavioral supports that we that we spoke of and uh, and counseling staff. So the middle school is about a 3.6% uh, increase. <clears throat> Excuse me. High schools 2.4% a little under half a million dollars. Um, additional social work capacity uh, going on there as well as in the special education area. Um, Monroe One BOCES, uh, just like the rest of us, but even more so for a BOCES, has had a lot of has a, had a very difficult time attracting one-to-one -one aides and paraprofessionals to work in their programs, especially with the very intense students. They tried on a pilot basis this year a new model, so that uh, there'd be more certificated teachers in the room and less one-to-ones. Uh, that model has worked well, and they're expanding it throughout their program for next year. So uh, depending on which programs your kids are in, some schools see a decrease in unit cost for that. And, de and depending on the program, and unfortunately the programs that we're in are the ones that had the increase. So that's why you see that increase there in special education. Central student services. Um, <clears throat> this is basically special education, uh, the area of Dr. Von Brogan for student services. Um, Investment in the restructuring of the nursing staff is, is one of the drivers here, uh, as well as uh, some of the supports that we provide to the non-public schools that we're really legally required to do so. So overall, an 8.2% increase there, or $794,000. And Darren, if I could just hold there for one yep. second. Um, so I, I, would, I, I do wanna highlight the, the fact that we have, um, as we implemented new initiatives at the um, at the central student services area. Um, we also have been um, tracking um, and, and asking um, a lot of questions relative to the value added. So we've added an additional nurse at all nine buildings. And that was, that was necessary. Um, it, it's necessary for the, um, not only the, the physical health, but our nurse is playing a significant role in the emotional well-being of of our students, and by all accounts, um, the, um, the 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 restructuring there um, has paid dividends as far as being able to meet better meet the needs of of students' physical, social, and emotional health. And and along those same lines, um, when we look at this budget area, um, we are talking about 
uh, increased supports and, and, and mental health needs. Um, this is our, our let, this was our first year ever in the history of Pittsburgh that we actually had a full-time um, social worker uh, within our um, teacher's contract that works at, at high school. I'm uh, speaking with, with uh, the social worker, um, the amount of um, students and families he's been able to work with that otherwise um, weren't identified has been uh, significant. Um, so uh, I, I did want to address this slide a little bit because the, the work in this area um, has been really to address social, emotional, and mental health, um, as well as physical health of our students. Thank you. Moving on to central instructional services, um, curriculum office and district textbook. Textbooks, as you know, are aided by the state on an allocation basis per student, as well as we have to share that money um, or buy textbooks for the private schools that were, are within our borders and it's called the textbook loan program. Same thing goes for um, library books, software and hardware. Uh, standards leaders, there's a little bit of restructuring there as well as the implementation of the um, collective bargaining agreement. Um, pupil personnel, um, that was for the behavior of specialists and it was part of the social emotional initiative. Uh, and there was some reallocation of a part-time clerical person from one department to, to the other. So 7.38 or $289,000 um, for this section of the budget. Support services, <clears throat> excuse me, um, auditing. Uh, if you recall, we did a, every five years, we have to do a, um, a bid for auditors. Um, for internal auditor and then also for external. This was our year for internal auditors. Uh, that was a little bit more expensive um, as well as um, the increased demands for the internal claims audit function. So we've budgeted appropriately for that. <clears throat> Fuel transportation, the reason you see a decrease there is our shortage of bus drivers. We actually are down a few FTE because of it and with some of the restructuring we've done to, to cover that and combining routes we're proposing to not uh, replace a couple of those positions as well as the average salary of our bus driver pool has decreased. Um, our overtime is up a little bit because of having to cover some of those routes. And then the other side of the coin is we don't have enough drivers to do all the special routes such as field trips or after school trips. So we're, um, the buildings are contracting more of that out and we're not incurring those costs. <clears throat> So overall support services is only a 0.43% uh, increase. Central administration, which includes the superintendent's office, board of education, uh, public information and human resources. Uh, board of education, you see a pretty large negative number there. As you recall, uh, about two months ago, you elected to not uh, belong to the New York State School Boards Association for next year. Uh, so that reflects that. Uh, still belonging to the Monroe County School Boards, obviously. Uh, the annual meeting code, that's the budget for uh, paying for uh, inspectors and ballots and all the things that go, go along with the actual vote. Uh, public information, we've opted out of a BOCES service uh, that has uh, affected some savings there. Uh, in the personnel services, the main driver there is we're, we've opted into a BOCES service called the Fellows Program which helps us with the shortage of substitute teachers throughout the year. It's, it's a program uh, that we do through Monroe to BOCES that um, provides students working on their teacher certification. Moving on to the, what we call unallocated or undistributed expenses. And these are kind of the things that are very difficult to um, parse out to other areas of the budget. And these are the required codes by New York State. Uh, debt service and internal transfers, uh, you see a decrease there. This uh, coming year, we have a half year payment on the energy performance contract that goes back to the huge capital project we did back in the early 2000s. So that is all over with. Uh, so there's some savings in, in the debt payment there. In a few minutes, you're gonna see we also have a reduction in building aid um, because of it. <clears throat> um, BOCES administrative charge, you recall the uh, BOCES capital project that we approved a while back. 
Uh, those costs have been factored in as part of the capital and administrative charges and benefits for the second year road uh, is not a major item to, to talk about. In the past years, we've seen that be in the double digit of percent of increase. Um, this year, we've seen the, the retirement system rates come down some. Uh, TRS is scheduled to go up. ERS is, is about the, the same. Uh, and the health consortium continues to operate very well, uh, as well as we are starting to get into uh, the high deductible health plan and some people opting for the lower cost plans. And then the new PDTA contract, this was the first year of not making a contribution to the health fund for teachers. So um, for the first time in a long time, the undistributed expenses is not a main driver of our budget increase. So when you put it all together, you can see the, the pie chart here. Um, and basically it boils down to approximately 85%. Is it not showing up on the screen here? No, we see it now. Pardon me? We see it now. Okay, you got the pie chart? Yeah. Okay, because it's not moving on my screen. Uh, about 85% of the total budget goes directly to programs that directly impact kids. And uh, if you've probably heard me speak of the ESSA program and the state and the federal transparency of how we have to report our numbers now. Uh, this past year was the first year for that. It's kind of interesting looking at that data uh, we measure pretty favorably as far as that percentage. Some districts are as low as 56%, some of the districts downstate. So putting it together, just a couple of different ways of looking at it. My eyes tend to go towards the chart to the right as far as looking at the total increase of, of $3.6 million, what the main drivers are. And you can see that, you know, as you would expect it to be, uh, schools, the money is going to schools and, and affecting the instruction of students uh, along with central student services. So moving on to the revenues, or as I like to say, how we're going to pay for it. Um, I'm going to start with state aid on the revenue chart here and the um, beige section is the 2021 draft budget or proposed budget. Our foundation aid um, in the state enacted budget uh, was scheduled to decrease by $194,000. Um, that is the sa exact same amount as was allocated to us from the Federal CARES Act uh, that's gonna come in as federal funds. That's part of the number down below where it says miscellaneous and other. So that gave the governor a little bit of a break. We did not get hit as hard by that because the allocation method was based on our title grants, how we are funded. And as you know, we don't get much title money uh, for our, a district of our size due to our low, uh, our high wealth and low needs. Full day conversion aid, you see a $220,000 decrease. Uh, this is the last year that we will get that conversion aid. It was a three year phase out. Um, <clears throat> transportation, our aid, we're projecting it to decrease a little. That's because our costs have decreased between the bus driver issues as well as fuel costs uh, being lower. BOCES, you recall the last couple of board meetings, we've done some budget transfers into BOCES services. That's what we did last year, and that helped our aid, BOCES aid to go up by $843,000. So what we're trying to do is, is try to keep that aid at that level. So in the uh, operating aid section, we've got about a 2.67% increase or $455,000. On the building aid side, we have a $2 million decrease in aid, and we expected that. We, we, we knew about that um, of $2 million, and we knew that for the EPC. Um, when we did the capital project, we put money into the debt service reserve, and there's very uh, limited how you can do that. But basically, any, any money that's left unexpended at the end of a capital project can go in for this purpose, uh, as well as outstanding payments. And when we restructured or, or refinanced all of our debt six years ago, our payments were lower. And rather than using those payments to fund the budget, we used it to put it into the reserve because we knew that this was gonna happen this year. So we're actually transferring money from the debt service reserve to help fund that. Urban Suburban is up a little bit and that's due to uh, state aid changes for Rochester City School and how the formula works where we get a piece of that aid. Uh, the miscellaneous other, 
Um, as I said, the federal CARES money is part of that number. Fund balance and reserves, uh, almost $3 million, up $1 million. So we've increased our use of fund balance and the reserves. A good part of that is coming from the debt service reserve to help fund or make up for that building aid reduction. <clears throat> our property tax levy is $3,882,000 increase or 3.76%. That is at the property tax cap. Uh, the reason why that number looks a little higher is, as I talked about with the state aid going away for the building aid, um, that makes our exclusion in the formula larger. So actually our tax levy that pertains to our actual operating budget outside of that debt service is about 2.18%. The difference has to do with that net difference in the state aid versus our debt payment. If we were to go to contingent budget, if the voters did not pa pass this budget, that $3,882,000 would represent lost revenue. And I would anticipate we'd have to make budget adjustments to, to cover that money. So just keep that in mind as well. As far as budget support and composition, I found this kind of interesting, this, this pie chart, not a wild change to it, but some change uh, to it. Um, our tax levy, levy is stable at 76% of our budget. Our local taxpayers are funding 76% of our budget, um, despite our state aid becoming less of a player in our budget, down to 17%. It was 18% last year. To keep the tax levy stable, we increased our use of fund balance from 1% to 2%. So we're doing what we can to keep that burden on the taxpayers uh, in, in check. <clears throat> Moving on from the general fund budget um, is the bus purchase reserve. Uh, we do this every year and it's basically similar to what you might have at your house, a savings account that you put money in for a few years, uh, hoping to replace the roof on your house, for example. We do this to replace our buses based on the board approved uh, replacement schedule. And what we're doing here is we're asking the voters uh, as we're required by law, can we please withdraw uh, $1.5 million out of the reserve account to buy seven uh, full-size buses and five 36 passenger wheelchair buses, some with air conditioning, some without, and one work, work truck with a utility bed. Um, the nice thing is, uh, unlike when you see a separate proposition for the purchase of buses in many other school districts in the county, they're actually levying additional tax and or they're asking to issue debt to buy their buses. We're not doing any of that. We're simply asking to take money out of the savings account to pay cash for the buses. And then over the next five years, as we receive state aid on those buses, that aid goes back into the uh, reserve to help replenish it. So it's there to work to, to help us out in future years. So that's just the language um, for that the voters will see in the booth. Again, there's no tax impact on this. Then I'll thank turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Darren. Um, just want to share a little bit about the effects of COVID-19 pandemic and how they've impacted not only our funding, but the voting process in general or specifically. Uh, the next couple of slides will provide a summary of these changes, uh, specifically to budget vote and election process, and then funding for the current year and future years. On May 1st, uh, the governor issued an executive order which modifies the rules under which school districts can conduct the 2020 annual meeting for the election of school board members and budget votes. Some of the highlights in that executive order are as follows. Um, one, there's a statewide uniform voting date, uh, school board elections and budget votes originally scheduled for May 19th will now take place on June 9th, 2020. And the annual budget hearing must be held seven to 14 days prior to the vote, which gives us a window between May 26th and June 2nd. Our public hearing is scheduled for May 26th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Also, the how we uh, do public notices has changed um, as far as the quantity in the past, uh, we were required to send four public notices out. Now, during uh, the time where we have um, a real compacted time frame, 
we're down to two notices. The first notice must be no later than 28 days before the election and include notice for an adjourned budget hearing. There's also language in the executive order around what's called the postcard notice, which means we must send out a postcard which details the date of the election, the date of the budget hearing, and a definition of a qualified voter. And so if I can just pause there for a second, a qualified voter in this election is no different uh, than a qualified voter in, in previous years. Uh, so you need to be 18 years or older. Uh, you need to be a resident on uh, Pittsburgh for more than 30 days. The manner of voting um, has changed significantly. This year, all of our votes will be done by ballot um, only. It will follow the same type of pattern that we always have when we've distributed absentee ballots. Uh, but at this juncture, uh, we will be uh, mailing absentee ballots uh, to um, all resident homes. We will be sending an absentee ballot to all qualified voters with a postage paid return envelope um, for, the, for, the, uh, for the budget and board election vote. Um, in there, we'll also include instructions um, should you need additional ballots uh, mailed to your home. School districts must submit their report card to the state education department no later than May 22nd, uh, 2020, 18 days prior to the budget vote. And the department must make its compilation available electronically, at least by June 2nd, seven days prior to the June 9th vote. As it relates to school board elections, there will be no minimum threshold for the number of signatures required for individuals to be placed on the ballot except that they must meet all other requirements, including applicable residency and age. So in other words, um, regardless of whether or not you uh, picked up a petition and had them signed and returned, um, this is a situation where um, anyone essentially could run for the board um, had they sent an email to our board clerk um, with their letter of intent. On the ballot candidates will be listed alphabetically. And then last, uh, ballots for small city school districts must be set 30 days before the election, which does not apply uh, to us. Uh, Darren, if you want to continue with the current environment. Sure. I'll, uh, I'm gonna talk about the state of the state, if you will, it's kind of the elephant in the room at the moment. Um, but this starts back when, in the beginning of April, when the legislature uh, and the governor reached an agreement on the budget. Uh, within that budget, there are a lot of big question marks, one of which was the governor or the Department of Budget, they have three measurement periods. Uh, one just ended on April 20th. Um, there's another one that goes from May 1st to June 30th, another from July 1st to December 31. And those, at the end of those periods, the governor or his Department of Budget um, has a plan to make reductions if there's certain parameters and the parameters are in the second bullet here. Basically, if the revenues are more than 1% below projections or, and or expenditures are more than 1% above uh, um, expect, expectations, uh, the director of budget is authorized to develop a plan uh, to reduce local assistance spending. Then what happens is the uh, legislature has 10 days to respond to that and come up with their plan if they do not, then the director of budgets plan becomes, um, goes into force. Uh, what's interesting is for that end of April plan, uh, we're past that 10 days right now and we have not heard anything. Um, if you'd talked to me a few weeks ago, I would have projected that it was gonna kind of like, kind of be like the budget development process where the governor would at least say, I'm recommending a reduction of X billions of dollars in total and then the legislature goes and works on it and they come up with something else. It's been very, very quiet. I'm told that the reason behind that is they're waiting to see if the, there's another stimulus package from the federal government that's gonna be of help. Um, but at the time of enacting the budget, the governor was projecting a $13.3 billion shortfall in state revenues. Um, and the chart below kind of shows what he was projecting as far as what the revenue receipts would be on a cash basis for the state um, and then moving forward over the next several years and what the surplus would be. 
And one thing that really struck me was for 2019-20, when you look at just a few weeks before the COVID closure, we were in a booming economy and things were going very, very well, yet the governor was still projecting a small deficit uh, for that year. So indicates that there were some, some problems going on, not just the COVID uh, in, induced, but the COVID is making it much worse. So with that being, as I said, the elf, elephant in the room, um, our proposed budget is balanced with the best known data. And right now the best known data is the enacted state budget. Um, we obviously realize that the governor could be coming out with some more rolling reductions, but the problem is there's some very big things that we don't know. We don't know what the extent of the reductions will be. We don't know if those reductions, especially for the ones that have to do with April and June, well, they, whether they'll affect the fiscal year that we're in right now, or it's going to be a reduction in next year's next budget year, uh, state aid. And we don't know how those reductions will be allocated to school districts. <clears throat> so we're forced to kind of look at what we do know. Um, and we do know that as a low need district, we're not a huge part of the solution for the governor's uh, budget deficit. That doesn't mean to say that we're, we're you know, we're, we're ignoring what could happen, but kind of like when we talk about when, when we have budget difficulties, um, reducing the amount of paper, we could totally eliminate how much paper we buy and, you know, we, we barely made a tenth of a percent impact on our budget. And that's kind of what it is for the low wealth school districts. If, if they took all of our aid totally away, um, he still has a long way to go. <clears throat> uh, unlike the state, we are in the best financial health that we've been in probably at least 15 years. Um, <clears throat> we do not have a history of operating deficits or worse yet, structural, we haven't had any structural deficits. So the school legally can't have a structural deficit. Rochester City is going through that right now. Uh, we have fund balance at the maximum of 4% and we have reserves. Now, reserves do have restrictions. That's why they're called restricted accounts for specific things, but some of them have more flexibility than others to help us. And I think you saw in, in the revenue presentation that we are starting to use some of those reserves to pay for certain things such as retirement system costs um, and post-retirement benefits, et cetera. Right now we're sitting on $33.6 million in our reserves, the biggest of which almost um, $24 million is in our capital reserves. And in order to use those funds, we need voter approval to do that. <clears throat> We're projecting a surplus for the current year. Um, we are working on uh, trying to quantify with more precision what we think that will be, uh, with it being such a strange year that we have some um, nuances to that, but we're, we're expecting a pretty decent uh, in line with our previous year's surplus that will help us into the new year as well. We also know that our community has come to expect certain programs and services and a level of performance of the district and fiscal stability and predictability. So in, in having these discussions both within our district and with my colleagues throughout the county and even other parts of the state, uh, at first it was, there was a big reaction to make a lot of big reductions, but the hard part is we don't know what that measuring stick is we're measuring against. So we don't know if we're hitting the target or not. Um, and during this time of um, turmoil and people feel like they're losing a lot, it's kind of hard to say, we're gonna cut these X things that you, that you value. And when they say, well, how much money are you trying to get to? I don't think saying, I don't know is a good answer. So being that we have the financial position that we have, um, we have some flexibility to do some things that perhaps some schools cannot. Um, we have we could use fund balance and reserves as far as our toolbox of things to do. Uh, we have the year-end surplus from the current year that can help weather some of these reductions, particularly if the first two reductions have to do with the current year. We have retirement attrition. Uh, we have a lot of retirements and we could potentially uh, not fill some of those positions. Um, Perhaps we have some savings to achieve from our lessons learned from remote learning and the way we do things or partnering with other school districts. Uh, Mid-year reductions to programs, that is not uh, one of the ones that we, we like to do. Um, I think if you watch what's going on at Rochester City, if you wait till mid-year, you have to make almost twice as much of a reduction to hit, hit it. 
and then we have a combination of any of the above that we can do to survive. So it's kind of unlike me right now. I think for 15 years, you've heard me uh, talk about building reserves and being financially prudent, et cetera, but we do that as rainy day funds. And with this uh, unprecedented time, I think it's pretty safe to say that it's raining right now. So um, if you have those funds put away for such a time, it almost seems disingenuous not to use those funds, at least in the short term, to get through that time. Thank you, Darren. Mm -hmm. So the proposed 2021 budget is balanced, uh, certainly remains within the property tax cap and it preserves our programs and services. It's calculated to be at 3.76% uh, as far as an increase over the approved 1920 tax levy. The tax levy increase um, due to the operational, the operating budget is 2.18%. Uh, the additional 1.6 per New York state law is an exclusion to the tax levy limit, basically because the voters already approved the debt issuance with the 2003 capital project. The proposed budget, um, as far as the, the, the county average, um, is certainly contained. Um, I think it's important to note that we also have the lowest foundation aid per pupil uh, in Monroe County. So I, I would highlight again that we're within the tax cap um, and with the help of reserves um, that have been um, growing over time, um, we are able to uh, maintain what we think um, our children are gonna need as they come back to school with us next year. Uh, next, Darren. Couple dates, uh, May 26th is our public budget hearing. Um, of note, we will change our format of our uh, board meeting on that night. Uh, there will be a presentation uh, followed by uh, public comment uh, after that presentation. On June 9th is the budget vote and board election. And per New York State order, this election will be done by absentee ballot only. Uh, absolutely no in-person voting. There will be no on-site voting. Uh, simply is not permissible. Ballots will be mailed to all eligible residents to the district with return prepaid postage. We will also specify um, a process uh, should you receive less ballots to your household um, than requested. So if there are two members in your family and for some reason you received one ballot, um, there will be a process for you to request a second ballot. So at this point, um, I'd like to um, address any questions or any type of discussion um, on behalf of the, the Board of Education. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, hey Mike, um, this is Pete. With regard to the absentee ballots, the ballots, the return completed ballots must be postmarked by June 9th. Is that correct? Must be in our, um, we, we must have them uh, by June 9th, by five o'clock. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. And I'm sorry, one more about the absentee ballots. It's, this is not an instance where a homeowner, for example, chooses not to wait to receive a ballot from the district. They can't just simply print one out and fill it out, or can they? We, we will be, um, we will not have them as of now. So let me just back up for a second, Pete. We're, we're meeting again tomorrow to, to dot our I's and cross our T's. Okay. As of, as of this point right now, we are not having a process for people to download and print anything. Um, I'm not sure what it would take for that to change based on our meeting tomorrow. But at this point in time, the process will be, we will do the mailing. Um, and if anyone needs additional ballots, we'll have a process for them to submit a request and then we'll send those uh, additional ballots out. Okay. The, the ballots will be, um, as people sign them they're, they're, or they return them, um, we'll have directions specifically for 
how to fill them out. Uh, and it's gonna be important that um, they also are able to sign their name in a legible manner um, on the return envelope um, as one part of um, auditing the process. And finally, on the same subject, some of us have had the benefit of um, extra residents in their homes that are over the age of 18 for more than 30 days. Do they qualify as eligible residents? They would. So eligible we are, and, and I'm, I'm hesitant to get into specifics right now, but I know that we are um, more than likely going to be um, sending a minimum of two ballots per resident resident's home and additionally to anyone that we're aware of that is 18 or over that has graduated or recently graduated that we're aware of. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I have another question along the same line there. How are you going to guarantee that it's a secret ballot if the envelope is signed so you, you know what the vote is because you've got the signature? Um, can you repeat that, Irene? Right. So, are you you're, you're asking for a signature on the ballot? So, isn't that not a, a secret ballot then? No, it's a signature on the envelope. Um, and they the are separated on, on the outside of the envelope. That that's that's not dictated by Pittsburgh. Um, that's dictated by um, the the New York State absentee ballot process. Um, what we're really want to we want to um, be very very um, structured in our um, receiving of the ballots, um, counting the ballots, locking the ballots. Uh, we have no idea, uh, to be quite honest, how many ballots we're going to receive. Um, in talking with, with other superintendents of, of those even in larger districts, um, it's going to be interesting to see if we can count the ballots in one night. And then we're working on a process if, if we can't. So we're going to be looking um, for a significant amount of workforce uh, to, with, with the oversight of the Board of Elections um, for us to receive, count, secure, announce um, that, that evening if possible. So the signature on the envelope is, um, even before this year, was always uh, in place. Uh, for absentee ballots. Hey, hey, Mike. Is Mike? Hi, Todd. Yeah. Um, is the absentee policy always been that, that it was the date that it had to be received, not the date postmarked? Uh, Deb, can you answer that? Or do you know the answer to that? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, absentee ballots have always been due by 5 p.m. the day of the vote. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. And Mike, with respect to um, quote unquote, our, our hope and our plans for opening in the fall, it, are all school districts um, required to submit like a plan B to, to be ready for that alternative if, if that were to come to pass? Well, I, I, I can just say, I, I don't know about the word required, but we are we are all working on it. Um, and we're, we're all, we, we meet three times a week um, and we're all working on that together. And finally, I just wanna th say thank you to Darren um, for his excellent presentation. Um, it gets better every year, Darren, thank you. Thank you. Especially considering the time element here, it's, uh, a little bit challenging to have to work under the time parameters that we've been given. So Darren, it was a great presentation. Thank you. And, and Amy, I think that's important to note that just a couple of weeks ago, we had no idea. Exactly. What, right. When our budget vote would be. That's exactly right. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay. So may I have a motion to approve the proposed budget presentation and adoption? So moved. I just lost my screen for some reason. So moved. Okay, I have Ted. Do I have a second? Kim. Kim. Any questions, comments? 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. And may I have an approval of the minutes? So moved. Irene, and a second. I can't, I can't see anyone. So if you could just shout your name out. <laughs> Thanks, Val. Okay. Thanks, Val. Any edits? No. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Okay, Board of Education reports. Um, as I mentioned the last time, very few meetings left. We did have a board president's meeting this week and we decided that we will be convening for one to two more Zoom sessions um, in light of the situation and how quickly things are changing. Um, the board presidents felt that it was a time where we could um, meet via Zoom and share what is happening in our respective districts. So I will keep you informed on the next date. We don't have one as of yet. Um, we're anticipating meeting after we hear the governor's message this Friday. And then the only other report, I know Kim, you wanted to report out on community outreach. Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I just can't see anyone. Okay. Um, yes, we met um, the, the community communications outreach committee met a couple weeks ago on well April 29th and so we reviewed three things that we'd already done which was a current position on the on the mandates and um, how it related to see if we want to make any changes to that we reviewed the current talking points on foundation aid and um, the um, the last one we did, was to look at the most up-to-date list of per pupil cost as a result of mandates. And believe it or not, that was nine pages long, the current mandates we have, which when you looked at nine page, pages of them, and some of them are old, like have been on there forever and they never go off, they just keep adding to them. So nine pages was a lot. So after looking at all those, we came up with two things. We actually did a COVID-19 talking points paper, which I think everybody commented on that. And um, the, as you know, probably all these uh, talking point papers go to the board presidents and then they distribute them as they see fit to the current, you know, to current board members. So we should be getting that. Did you get that yet, Amy? Not yet. Okay, so that probably should be out tomorrow then because I think a couple people commented on it today. So those will be coming out. And then we also, wrote our um, a Monroe County School Board advocacy letter to for districts to use if they want to. And as you all know, we already came up with our own advocacy letter. So we'll use that. But I think there are districts that are using um, the advocacy letter to um, send. Okay. Great. Thanks, Kim. You should get those both tomorrow, I think, Amy. Yeah, they haven't come in yet, but I think that was just because um, everyone was weighing in. Right. Okay. That's it. Dates to remember, our next board meeting via Zoom will be the 26th of May. And that is it under Board of Education reports. Financial report, Darren. All four bids are on the consent agenda. Thank you. Human resource report, Mike. Uh, first for your consideration is the professional staff report. Um, it has um, uh, the resignations of some teachers that will be leaving us at the end of the school year and then uh, two modifications. Okay, may I have a motion please? You have to shout out at me. So moved. Second. That Renee and Val? Yep. Okay. That's pretty good without being able to see you. R Renee is first, Val second. Okay. Any questions? Nope. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 
thank you. Second for your consideration is the support staff report and there is a resignation. Okay, we have a motion to approve the support staff report. So moved. Second. Ted and Kim? Yes. Any questions? No. All no. in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. And then finally, um, we have the first reading of the 10-year recommendations. Um, no motion is needed on that. We'll be bringing that back to the board at the next meeting for your consideration and vote. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Special Education Report, Elizabeth. Yes, we have a first reading of revised policy 7680. Mm -hmm. And then all CSE and CPSE recommendations are on the consent agenda. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, superintendent's report, Mike. Uh, there is not a need for an executive session this evening. Uh, just to bring your attention to the consent agenda is a uh, proposed policy 5676 on privacy and security for student and staff data. Um, also wanted to reach out to see if there are any questions on your first reading uh, for policy 7680 and independent educational evaluations. Mm -hmm. Were there any questions? No, none. None. Thank you. Uh, so if I could just take a, a few minutes, I, I sent out an email or in my update this past week, this past Friday, um, I talked a little bit about the notion of opening schools, uh, summer school, um, decisions that, that are still unknown. And, and I feel that for some, um, they, they took from that, that we're not opening school, um, still questions about summer school and, um, and how can they advocate one way or the other for the district to open or close. So I thought if I, if I just could be as clear as possible here and, and, and kind of bring us back to uh, the first public comment question around what do we know about the fall? Every Wednesday since we've closed, and I, I have to thank Dr. Mendoza for his accessibility. Um, all of the county superintendents uh, meet with Dr. Mendoza. We meet for about an hour. Um, currently, we are discussing opening schools in September and what that would look like. Ultimately, uh, the decision to open schools uh, will either be up to executive Adam Bello uh, or Dr. Mendoza or possibly the governor uh, to make an official decision. So that decision-making chart doesn't necessarily say that the Pittsburgh Central Schools will decide to open in September we do believe that decision will be made for us. If you, if you recall, all of our county schools were closed based on the decision of Dr. Mendoza and Monroe County Executive Annabello. Uh, two days later, the governor closed all schools in New York State. So no one had a choice. Closing and opening schools during a pandemic is not the decision um, of an individual school community. Um, I believe it's going to be a decision um, that is made by either a county, a region, or possibly the state. Um, having said that, uh, control has certainly shifted a little bit from the state to our region. Uh, as Governor Cuomo approved today, the county's reopening plan in four phases. And it's beautiful to see schools as being one of those phases. It's phase four. And as we work with and conference with Dr. Mendoza, it's important for everyone to know that our meetings are about the things we need to do and the things we need to plan for as all of us want and hope to open our doors to students and staff in September. Um, we want those doors open. Um, we we um, feel that right now we're in a, um, a huge step in the right direction uh, and know that the county um, health department um, will be reviewing each phase and, and hopefully um, we can get to phase four even well before September. I also think it's important um, for the board to hear that 
um, in my inbox um, and my through email primarily, I receive quite a bit of emails from parents that say they will not come back until there's a cure or a treatment um, or a vaccine for COVID. Um, I would say I hear from an equal amount of parents um, that they're upset that we're not even back already. We should be back in school now. And then I would say I hear from a third of the people that are pretty much in the middle. Um, they they want to come back, but they want to make sure that the people are safe. And so people's emotions are certainly um, where they should be. Um, I think people are um, at different ends of being fed up um, uh, with having schools closed. Um, I think I have three kids um, and it's, it's, it's hard, but my three kids are older. I couldn't imagine if my three children were in the elementary school um, and uh, both of us were working. Um, so I, I just think it's important to, to recognize the legitimacy of the impact that schools closing have on families. Um, and so we're working really hard to create a plan where we can be back open in September um, and, um, and mitigate as, as many uh, possible concerns um, along the way. So I, I, I also want the board to understand and, and the people that are listening to this that um, when we meet with Dr. Mendoza um, and, and all of the superintendents in the county, um, we all want the same thing. We, we want to be open. Um, we also want to be able to propose a plan that will calm the worries um, of, of our community um, so that we feel that we have something in place where not only are we open, but uh, parents can feel comfortable uh, sending their, their children uh, to us. The other thing I think is important to mention is summer school has been thrown around quite a bit in the um, in some of the governor's press conferences. So as of right now, we're also working on a plan with the county uh, that will allow for summer school in the traditional sense of summer school, which means um, summer school for uh, high school students that, that need credit recovery uh, in order to graduate or in order to stay on track to graduate. So that's what he means by summer school. It doesn't mean that summer school, we're extending the school year um, through the, the summer. I want to clarify that. Um, but similar, similarly for us, we're also working on a plan for extended school year services uh, for students that qualify. Um, and and we're, it's kind of our gray area right now. And I know that um, our director of special education um, is um, working on a lot of different plans uh, to see what might be feasible uh, to help our students to qualify for, uh, for summer school. And then along those same lines, and, and in talking to Dr. Mendoza, we learned that he's also begun meeting with town supervisors and mayors across the region. Um, so they can begin their planning on summer activities um, and, and develop best practices as they think about reopening uh, recreation centers or day camps. Um, and and I, I think it's just critical for everyone to understand that as a region, um, we're all putting our heads together to create a safe and, and a pragmatic approach or plan for reopening our area. Um, just some other, other things of note that I think are important. Um, it, it's, it is remarkable. It, it's remarkable that um, we have sent out to families $55,500 uh, in grocery gift cards. Um, and we've been able to send those out um, because of the, the hearts of the people in our community. Um, we've received uh, checks from people outside of our community. Um, we've received checks from retired teachers, um, from businesses, um, from foundations uh, in our um, Pittsburgh Education Foundation has, has worked hard at, at getting out the notice that if you're in need, um, let us know and we'll see what, what we can do. 
So we've sent out three um, different issuances of mailings uh, to families uh, that have totaled um, close to $56,000. It also puts things in perspective of uh, where people are at in our community as far as um, going through hard times, um, having to worry about basic needs being met. Um, and it's um, something that for all of us need to be so proud of that we're in a community where we will um, pull each other up when we need help, um, knowing that everyone will eventually get back on their feet um, and will be um, better from that. Uh, also of note, we're at the point now where we've issued over 350 computers uh, to students and families uh, that are in need. Uh, this week, I'm hoping to have a date set for high school graduation. Um, I'm sorry, by next week. So the, the, um, the, the two choices that we're working on right now are having high school graduation take place at either our stadium fields or at RIT. Um, so obviously we can control the date if they're on our stadium fields, uh, but we can't control the weather. And, and that's um, a little bit of concern for me. Um, in working with RIT, they are looking at different social distancing um, and health and safety ways to troubleshoot bringing people together. Um, the dates that we're looking at are the, the last weekend uh, in July and Saturday and Sunday uh, or the first Saturday in August. So um, hopefully very soon, uh, we're waiting for confirmation um, from RIT uh, and then we'll make a decision. I'd like to update uh, the board on our June 6th celebration. Uh, it's a date that we're um, going to celebrate um, our graduating seniors. Uh, we are working with um, a printing company that will um, be recreating um, all of our high school seniors yearbook pictures um, and transposing them to a, um, what we believe right now will be a pretty sturdy poster um, size portrait. Um, shortly, um, we'll be working out the details from there, but it looks like um, we're going to um, have or ask um, all of our staff uh, to be able to um, hold up a poster of our uh, seniors and have the entire uh, Main Street and Pittsford line on one side of the sidewalks was Sutherland graduates and uh, pictures of Sutherland graduates. The other side with pictures of Menden graduates. Um, we're going to ask storefronts to, to decorate um, and the town and village uh, to certainly um, participate uh, in celebrating our seniors. Um, I will say that the town supervisor and village mayor have been extraordinary to work with um, as far as permits um, and um, wanting to be part of the celebration. Uh, we plan on having um, our seniors and their parents meeting at so Sutherland parking lot and driving uh, down West Jefferson, taking a left end of State Street. Um, and as they drive down State Street, they will be hopefully greeted um, with um, hundreds of um, K through 12 and district staff holding up pictures um, of the seniors um, in recognition of all of their efforts um, and, and certainly in a recognition of the sacrifices that they've had to make. Um, on Friday, we have a more full scale um, logistical meeting uh, where we'll be talking in more depth. So more information to come on, on June 6th. Uh, grades five and eight celebrations uh, are moving up students. Uh, it's a big deal when you're in fifth grade and leaving elementary and going to middle school. And when you're in eighth grade, uh, leaving middle school and going to high school. And all of our buildings have had special celebrations for them. And so we're working on um, getting our uh, students and staff and families together um, and celebrating in, in, in some way uh, in grades five and eight as well. And then I would just, I, I have to just mention that um, how hard it is um, on so many fronts uh, for being away. It's, it's, the list is honestly endless 
Um, and it's, it, you kind of feel helpless at sometimes knowing that um, people are making so many sacrifices and their, their, their families um, have been turned upside down or, the, or, or job loss or um, managing um, young kids and, and older kids all together. And, um, and it's hard. Um, we've never, ever, um, anyone, um, have had to, to face a pandemic like this in our lives. And I think the other part that's, that's, that's made things so hard as I, as I continue to reflect on this is there's not specific dates where we can say, if we can just bear with us until um, June 30th, and then we'll go back to normal. It's, um, it, it, it's, it's hard for people to wrap their heads around um, how long are we gonna be in this state? Um, and, and there's so many questions that are unanswered. So, so I would just ask um, for those of you that are out there um, that are really, really struggling to reach out um, to, um, to a friend, a family member, uh, the school, um, because if you're feeling really worried or scared or, or frustrated or mad, um, that's probably how you should feel and it's, and it's normal. Um, but it's important to, to have someone to talk with about that. The other thing I, I think is important for anyone that's, that's listening to this tonight um, is to, to have hope uh, because things will get back on track, right? I mean, they're, they're going to get back on track. Uh, we are going to get back to school. Uh, the economy is going to recover. Uh, as a community, we will be stronger. Uh, we'll, we'll be better um, than, than we can ever imagine. Um, but right now we're in it. Um, but we're on our way out of it too. Um, I, and, I, and I think that that's important as far as mindset. So um, we are um, starting uh, to plan for reopening the region. Um, I think it's important for people to practice um, the, the safe things that we know are working, social distancing and hand washing and, and all of the, 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 the wearing the masks. And then each phase goes through um, if we do this well. I think that we're in better shape possibly than we might realize. Um, but you, you need to please hang in there. You need to uh, please have hope um, and, and know that um, the Pittsburgh Central School District wants to be a place um, where if you need help or support uh, that we can provide that to you. Um, so pick up the phone if you need it, send an email to uh, myself, uh, to our student services director, uh, to the building principals, um, you're, you're certainly um, not in this alone. So um, know that um, I'm thinking about our community um, all the time uh, in every aspect of that word community. So um, want people to know that uh, things, things will get better. And I, and I think that we're closer than, than many um, might believe. So that's it, Amy. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay, may I have an approval of the consent agenda? So moved. Kim? Yeah. Kim and? Pete. Okay. Pete. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Old business, does anyone have anything under old business? If not, I just wanted to piggyback a little bit on what Mike was talking about. And first off, on behalf of the board, we would once again like to just recognize those that are in our community who are on the front lines of, of the crisis. The first responders, healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, grocery store workers, <clears throat> Everyone who is in an essential business during this time, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts and our continued prayers for your safety and wellness. 
And as I've stated over the past few weeks, our board is very proud of how the district has handled the crisis, how we've prioritized the safety and security and health of our staff, students, and families. Um, each day and week that passes while we're all in New York State pause, families are facing new hardships. It's in how we address the hardships that speaks volumes about who we are as a community, contributing in ways we never could have imagined. We've all, I believe, and the board believes, have become better citizens, taking time to focus our efforts on what's important and what should take precedence in our lives under these unique circumstances. So last year, or last year, last week, feels like last year, uh, last week was Teacher Appreciation Week. And if there was ever a time to thank our teachers, this would be the time. During household pandemic learning, we've all gained, we meaning all parents, have gained a sense of appreciation for the talent and the patience and creativity that it takes to be an educator, especially under duress. I believe that we would all agree that learning remotely does not replace in-classroom instruction, but teachers are rising to the challenge of a 360 degree shift in how to best provide essential learning during these uncertain times. We thank you. Is it perfect? No. But as I've been saying in my house, practice makes progress, not perfect. And perfection during a crisis just doesn't exist. So our continued gratitude to our families and our students, we miss you. We all look forward to a safe, healthy reentry to our schools. And as always, stay safe and be well. Um, our next order or item on the agenda is new business. Does anyone have anything to say? No? Okay, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved. I heard multiple voices. I heard Ted, Kim. I can do a second. Okay, Ted and Kim. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thanks to everyone who joined us this evening. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Be safe. Good night. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Yeah.